Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to day two of the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative Summer Sandbox. Um, we, day two of week one, we are really happy to be back together again after um, our kickoff yesterday had four really excellent um, presentations um, on four different topics. And this morning, um, on behalf of the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative, we are excited to welcome our first session of the day, Jamie Wadawick, who will be presenting VR, AR in the classroom, accessible approaches to new technology. Um, before we get started, we can go ahead um, and introduce the members of the team here really quickly. I'm Molly Buckley Marudis, and together with Shelly Rose, we started the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative last May. And thanks to the growing team, particularly our graduate assistants who are here today, um, the project keeps growing and evolving, and we're really excited to give this sandbox a try. So thanks for being here. Um, we have Kalita O'Brien, one of our graduate assistants with us. Thank you, Kalita, and Will Fistek, um, another graduate assistant here with us today. All right, with that introduction, I will turn it over to you, Jamie. All right, great. Thank you uh, so much for having me. This is really exciting and I'm happy to be a part of it. And yes, as you mentioned, what I want to talk about today is something that uh, I've gotten my hands in recently uh, as an instructional design specialist with Savannah Technical College. Uh, and I'll be talking a bit about virtual reality and augmented reality and ways that we can try to make that new technology accessible uh, in the classroom. So um, I'll just provide a brief overview of the abstract and the uh, organization of today's discussion. Um, of course, as K through 12 and higher educational institutions embrace and invest in educational technology, a continued downside or maybe question uh, that has been a part of that initiative is uh, the question of access. So, um, you know, are we, uh, as we embrace this new technology, um, are we leaving any students behind, any institutions behind, any faculty members behind? <clears throat> so what I'd like to do today is kind of think through some of those questions um, and then provide a couple of examples towards the end of the talk of how some of this technology can be applied more universally um, with minimal costs to students and to faculty. So what we'll do today is first I'm going, I'm going to situate the question of accessibility in the context of Savannah Technical College, which is a two-year institution with a vocational focus. Um, then I'll open it up to some, uh, to, to some discussion. We'll see uh, if, if any of you have had any experience with AR or VR technology, if there were any wins, if there were any opportunities just in terms of you know, opening up the classroom to, uh, to technology, other technology. And then what I'll do at the very end of the talk is I'll introduce several of those learning tools um, that bring with them kind of a high tech upside um, and that are also accessible, meaning that they're usually, there's little to no cost attached to them and they're using devices that uh, tend to be pretty ready, readily available in, in most classrooms. And most, I would say this, this, this discussion is probably geared towards secondary ed and higher ed. And uh, as an a little bit more of an introduction to me, uh, I'm Jamie. Um, I am an instructional designer with Savannah Technical College. Um, I am a, a little bit behind the scenes now, spending most of my time playing around with a lot of this new tech. Uh, but I've spent the better part of 15 years in a variety of different classrooms. Um, I started teaching at Binghamton University, um, where I earned a PhD in, in French history, as we, we discussed. Um, uh, from there, I left and I went to, into the corporate world for a little bit, and I taught um, uh, leadership, compliance, on-the-job skills with CVS Health as a corporate trainer. And then, uh, most recently, I spent several years teaching high school social studies. Uh, specifically grades 10, 11, and 12. So uh, I have a, a, a pretty good familiarity with, with learners of all different types. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's sort of more recently that I've really spent a lot of time investing in this new, this new world of educational technology. 
Um, so as an instructional designer, as I just mentioned, my job is to find and to implement the latest in educational technology. And as we talked about, we were sort of chatting before the, before the talk began, there's all of these different tools and all of these different platforms uh, is, that we've kind of adopted in the last year, a uh, year and a half especially. Uh, so, so trying to, to find those tools that work uh, and find those tools that, that really sort of, you know, drive home the pedagogical goals of instructors is, is exciting uh, and relevant. And as the um, administration team at uh, Savannah Technical College stated, and it, it, it as early back as my interviews with them, is that my, my job is basically to build courses that are going to be 2035 ready uh, this year and next year. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a pretty, uh, you know, it's a pretty hefty endeavor. Uh, and one that raises two questions, right? What will that technology even look like in 2035? And how is this initiative going to be successful when we know we experienced this during the pandemic? 30% uh, of Americans don't have regular access to uh, broadband internet. So <clears throat> these are questions that are you know, related to this issue of accessibility and certainly things that we have to think through as both instructional designers and as educators. <clears throat> Excuse me, so some of the lessons that we learned over the course of the past year or so is that educational technology is a great way to engage students who are working in these asynchronous and hybrid learning environments, right? So a lot of educators said, yes, I'm on board, give us all the tools. But at the same time, of course, these tools can be expensive. So which tools are the best? Uh, which tools will integrate with the, with the tech and the software that we already have, which will meet the, new, the needs of our faculty and students. And again, a lot of these questions kind of emerging that all rel uh, gravitate around this, this issue of accessibility. Uh, and of course, we enc encountered students who didn't have access to reliable internet and or reliable uh, personal devices like tablets and computers. Uh, and of course, there were faculty who, you know, kind of resisted the, the, the new tech and or, you know, presented a pretty hefty tech learning curve as well. So it's not just the students that we're talking about, but it's also instructors as well. Right. And as many of you, I'm, I'm sure, are familiar, right, some of the, the present tech barriers that we know about, right, access to that reliable Internet, broadband Internet. Um, 25 to 30 percent of students do not have that in the United States, so that continues to be an issue. Access to personal devices, as I mentioned, um, the study from Education Week uh, in this April uh, notes that 50 percent of students do not have access to uh, things like tablets, laptops, desktop, desktop computers regularly may have to share them or may not have them at all. And of course, ESL students face um, added language barriers, while students with IEP and 504 plans also may require additional support when these tech pieces are integrated. And then when you kind of um, you think about those tech barriers in the context of higher education, right? each one of the considerations on the left is still relevant in the context of higher education, but oftentimes students in that setting um, face added financial burdens, such as tuition, uh, the cost of books, and so on. And related to that, um, I just read a study in uh, Inside Higher Ed is that there's a kind of a prevalence of this question of self-doubt and, and self-efficacy among many students in higher education settings. And that's certainly the case here at Savannah Technical College, which serves a, a kind of a diverse student population, uh, many of whom are adult learners. So Savannah Technical College, as a part of our kind of a context for this discussion, Savannah Technical College is a two-year institution with an emphasis on vocational training and career readiness. Um, there are approximately 4,000 students who are enrolled in degree programs, certificate programs, and continuing ed programs. In-state tuition for full-time students is around $3,000 per academic year, so it's affordable. Uh, and some of our top degree granting programs include healthcare, specifically in the fields of, of nursing uh, and welding and automotive repair. So as you can see, a, a, a kind of a true vocational type setting. Um, 
students, adult students between 25 and 64 make up half of the student population. So again, as I'm building and playing around with a lot of these new educational tools, these are questions that I have to keep in the in the front and center, uh, specifically, um, you know, when we're working with students who, who don't have a lot of familiarity with, with a lot of these new tech tools. So as a part of my role, um, we have be recently been awarded a almost $5 million grant from the US Department of, Edu uh, of Labor to support the development of workforce ready training, uh, specifically in the fields of manufacturing, information technology, and healthcare. Uh, and the purpose of the grant is to really, uh, you know, expand online course offerings and then enable technology based learning. Um, so uh, the title of the talk today is about AR and VR technology, virtual reality, augmented reality technology. Uh, and, and that's the goal is to build as much of that stuff into the curriculum as possible, given all of those challenges that I just mentioned. Um, and for the sake of context, as I mentioned to Kalita and to William uh, before this talk started, um, we've been very fortunate that we can kind of play around with these tools uh, and get them going. The grant really kind of expanded the scope of, of what we're doing here. So we were able to bring on a team of instructional designers. Um, we were able to purchase an online authoring system, uh, which we, we use Lectora, Captivate, um, yeah, Storyline 360 or other examples of that. Um, we were able to purchase VR headsets and curriculum from a company called Transfer VR. We're able to purchase digital credentialing tracker uh, called Badger. And we're also able to purchase some devices, some Android tablets for student use in the classroom. So we've been very fortunate I I as far as the financial piece of the puzzle goes. Um, and recently, we deployed our VR technology for the first time in a fast track to manufacturing course. Um, that is kind of a work ready course uh, designed to get students familiarized with the field of manufacturing and ultimately to get them job offers at the end of the four week um, curriculum. And I think we got two people placed and three others are, are going to um, attend Savannah Technical College full time in the fall. So it's a, a pretty big win. And this is the first time that I played around with the VR headsets. And it's the first time that the students had the opportunity to do so as well. Um, and what they're doing here in these images is that they're um, they're working their way through uh, safety protocol and safety standards, kind of like OSHA standards um, in uh, in the virtual environment. They're they're in a manufacturing plant uh, facility, so they have that hands on experience, uh, which was as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, I expected this to be really cool and I expected to be impressed, but it exceeded all of my expectations. Um, it was immersive, it was fun, it was gamified, it was, it was, it was great. Right. Research. What does research say about using AR and VR technology in the classroom? Um, as I mentioned, the VR environment, the learning environment is immersive. Um, you are in the plant or in the manufacturing facility. Um, and of course, that type of learning is experiential. And, and chances are that by doing the tasks, the students are going to retain it better. Um, and because it's experiential, it also benefits students with certain disabilities like ADD, ADHD. And then VR learning programs are usually built kind of similarly to video games so that the learning environment <clears throat> and the tasks that you're supposed to complete as part of the curriculum tend to be goal oriented. Uh, and, and therefore, it tends to motivate students to complete that material. Some results of this very early, and again, we only had eight students in this, in this section, uh, but some results that were expected and not expected from this very early trial run with VR curriculum. Um, expected is that most students were really, really engaged in the immersive VR learning environment. Most students highlighted it as their favorite part of the course, hands down. 
Not expected, though, is that some students, and specifically the two out of the eight female students, expressed some reluctance or intimidation with the new learning technology. Um, and as somebody who's always been kind of uh, attentive to the gender dynamics of a classroom, that kind of stood out to me as um, something to, to certainly to look into uh, about this question of accessibility. Expected, right? VR training satisfied that curiosity about hands-on learning. Up until this point, students said, we want to go into the facilities. We want to, um, you know, see what these jobs entail uh, and, and, you know, the more hands-on kind of learning. Um, not expected is that after so several sessions with the VR equipment, some students actually expressed that they were kind of bored with the um, with the learning environment with the with the VR headsets, and I thought that that kind of stood out uh, as as something that I certainly didn't expect initially. Um, and then finally, I would say that overall it was a, a tremendous win. Um, the students, as I mentioned before, students really highlighted this as their favorite part of the of the material of the course. Um, but uh, as a whole, these VR modules did not completely solve for the question of student motivation. Um, I think two out of the eight students completed the full curriculum, and then um, many of them kind of left it hanging. <clears throat> and I, I was in there one day, <clears throat> excuse me, towards the end of the session, um, and they kind of preferred to you know, hang around and chat after lunch instead of um, you know, get into the headsets. So that stood out to me. Uh, is unexpected and is uh, interested and is a piece that I kind of want to follow up with as we get into this more. Um, so my conclusions, and again, this is a very, very small sample. This is eight students uh, from a four week course. Um, so these are these are pretty broad conclusions. But the, this question of accessibility to learning technology um, should not just be understood as a financial uh, piece. It should not be understood in just dollars and cents uh, or of simply providing students with the technology that they need to uh, experience a VR world, for example. Instead, this question of accessibility is actually more complicated. And it also depends on a couple of other factors. So for example, it depends on the learner's exposure to and familiarity with technology in general. So those students who don't have a lot of exposure to, um, you know, computers and video games and so on, um, they tend not to be as comfortable uh, with the equipment. And then I think related to that is learners, the learner's gender, right? And the exposure of female students in particular with game-based learning technology. Um, it seemed as though, and this is a complete conjecture, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems as though the male students, um, you know, sort of remark that, oh, this is like my PlayStation or this is like my Xbox. It seems as though their exposure to video game systems really kind of benefited their um, willingness to participate with the VR equipment. <clears throat> so I think that that's something to keep in mind uh, as we as we kind of unpack the question of accessibility. And then, of course, learners' motivation. That's if you've been in the classroom. Um, that's a <laughs> that's a challenge that I think we'll we'll never stop kind of working through. Um, but this this it's important to note that this learning technology, uh, VR headsets, the uh, the most state of the art stuff, doesn't automatically just flip a switch for students with low motivation, right? And based on some of those pieces above, right, exposure to technology in previous educational settings, gender maybe, right. <clears throat> The, uh, the new technology might actually further inhibit their willingness to, to participate and to, to get into that, that, that you know, cutting edge technology. So um, what I wanna do now is offer you all, I'm in the South now, so y'all, the opportunity <clears throat> to kind of think through this with me if you, if you have any kind of input about this. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> But some some related questions, some 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 points of consideration that we could talk about is if you've encountered issues with tech accessibility among your students, if you noticed anything, um, if you've maybe successfully deployed a new learning tool, only to find that the students aren't into it, maybe they didn't like it, um, you know, maybe you've hesitated to incorporate learning technologies for reasons of cost, uh, which has certainly been the case for me as a teacher. And then, you know, anything else that's related. So I'll open it up if anybody has any <clears throat> uh, thoughts or points or questions or anything at this point.
And then what we'll do after this is we'll get into some of those uh, some of those tools that I think are fairly accessible. <clears throat> Well, first, I think we can pause. I just want to thank you, give you a small round of applause, Jamie. A Zoom applause. That was um, incredibly thought provoking. And I'm really looking forward to getting into some of the, the questions you've raised here. So thank you for a really thoughtful um, presentation. I love the expected, not expected framework. Uh, very nice kind of heuristic. So very helpful to get our heads around. Um, with that said, um, yeah, let's jump in to some of the questions here. So I do want to bring up, so this past year, I had the honor to work in a somewhat, I guess, underserved area um, school, but we had access to Nearpod, I guess the subscription based part of it. It wasn't the free version. It was the more advanced version. And it, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but, and, and I did incorporate some of the, I guess the VR that it has, I, I forgot what it was called, but, um, and I'll actually talk about that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I thought it was, I mean, it was really cool because it allows you to kind of transport your classroom into a different area. Um, I, I actually used it a lot during a review session, um, where I try to, make one of the texts, it was the kite runner that we read um, and, and apply it into Afghanistan and bring an Afghanistan setting to try and see, hey, if we can have some, some good conversation in a kind of a review way to kind of apply what we knew and learned from the book um, using this VR. And I think the things the students engaged with it. One thing, um, and, and forgive me for not remembering, I the name of the other platform but there was another platform that was vr based and you could actually kind of in some regards walk around um mm -hmm. or or if not walk around just kind of view around and then the teacher can uh apply almost like checkpoints or at least areas of information that the student can interact with and say hey there's like this cool tree over here and yeah has some sort of neat facts applied to it but it's completely on the students end to interact with that um and i don't know it seems like more more things like that might be cool um mm -hmm. but but again dealing with at least from a financial side of accessibility um some of these kind of things come into play so so i don't know super cool super excited with all of it and i'm I'm super interested in this. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's cool that you had the chance to play around with some of that. Um, and, and what you mentioned is exactly what I have in mind as far as, um, you know, this accessible technology goes. So yeah, that's cool. Thank you. And I'm glad that it, it sounds like the students had a pretty good time with it. So, so that's good too. <clears throat> Anybody else? Sorry, I've got a bit of a Georgia allergy. It's new. <laughs> I think that that second question is a real point of tension um, for me at times with trying new technologies to find that students might not like it um, or are resistant to it. I think of those sort of emotional responses, uncomfortable, unsure, mm -hmm. and it feels like there's a tipping point sometimes it's working past the point of discomfort and it's successful, but sometimes there's like a cognitive dissonance. Like there's yeah. already like, I'm signing off. I tried this in another class. I just want to get back to face-to-face -face learning. And mm -hmm. I, this is not with VR as much as other kinds of new technologies. I haven't really explored VR or AR. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it would be great to hear. Yeah. yeah. If you, what types of strategies, um, I mean, one of and Will knows this, one of the things I try to encourage is a spirit of tinkering, that it's about, this is not about being the best at this. Our job is just to try to learn with it, to, to feel, the goal is to feel more comfortable by the end of the, yeah, like the digital storytelling assignment. You, you won't get points for having the best story, digital story, um, because you're super confident already, like everyone can do well on that assignment and you 
you have to feel part of it is learning to be uncomfortable. So I'd love to hear what you, how you approach that or success stories. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, being thrown into, uh, you know, pandemic learning on the fly uh, as a high school teacher um, was kind of eye-opening in a lot of ways. I was still working on um, the instructional design certificate uh, at that point, so I had a lot of of um, incorporating that new technology. I'm getting feedback, sorry. I don't know, we'll pause it. There we go. That's better. Um, so, you know, I had the I had the tools in the toolbox, I guess, but I did encounter some students who, um, and I don't know if it was linked to this question of motivation. Like, I would rather just sit and be passive in the classroom, or I would rather sit and be passive at home and do multiple choice questions to the end of the time, you know, um, because I think that some students are used to that. Uh, and I think that they're comfortable with that, as you mentioned, Molly. Uh, so I think it is a question of, of comfort zone. And, and with that said, I don't think that just because we're talking about this high end, super tech savvy, uh, you know, these, these, these really fun learning tools that are, you know, VR based, you put the headsets on and you're transported to a different world. I don't think based on my experiences with the students in the fast track course, I don't think that this is the end of in person teaching. I think that there will always be a space for teachers um, <clears throat> to help students through those kind of the, the soft skill, uh, you know, you know, questions of motivation, uh, those types of problems. I think that teachers are uh, essential to that. So that's a that's a great point and related, I think, uh, to this this issue of accessibility. Any other questions or comments or points? <clears throat> Okay, well, we'll jump into some tools, some of these tools that I have kind of picked out, um, and these are meant to be accessible. Um, and as I mentioned, when we're thinking about this question of accessibility, I think that the, I guess, the more exposure that students have to technology in the classroom, even starting small, even starting with, with some of the tools that I have kind of uh, mapped out here, I think that that helps kind of give them the foundations for success as we go on in the future. I think that uh, in five years, 10 years time, I think that a lot of employers are gonna rely on VR kind of training because it reduces their bottom line. That's what I'm hearing on, on, from this end. <clears throat> and I think that a lot of schools are going to, you know, uh, have the opportunity to invest a little bit more in this technology as it comes out and becomes more accessible. So I think that giving students uh, a nice jumping point with some of these, you know, small steps is, is going to be important down the road here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about virtual reality pieces and augmented reality pieces. Um, <clears throat> they don't have to be expensive. I've used many of the tools that I'll talk about today, uh, both in the context of my own teaching and in the context of building it into instructional design. Um, the, the tools that I've used that I've incorporated here, most of these are pretty user friendly and up until, you know, fairly recently uh, in this role as an instructional designer, I don't think I would have labeled myself as particularly, um, tech savvy, but these are, these are pretty easy to use. Um, and, uh, I don't want anybody to feel turned off because we'll kind of fly through a bunch of these, I think. And then, um, you, you know, these are, these are user-friendly uh, and, and, and good to use uh, and, and easy to work with and build. Um, so let's talk about augmented reality first. Augmented reality or AR, um, what it does is it utilizes a, a device like a smartphone or a tablet and it makes the real world a little bit more interactive for students. So, um, you know, a good example um, that you may or may not be familiar with is the, the popular Pokemon Go. So if either you or if your kids uh, play Pokemon Go, right, you can see here in this image that what it does is it pulls up the Pokemon in the real world environment, and then you kind of manipulate that on the screen. So, uh, you know, when you're thinking about AR, just think about the like holograms that you might pull up um, as you utilize devices and so on. So the first couple of examples that we'll go through will be um, augmented reality based. So one of my favorite tools, and this isn't really, it's not necessarily AR or VR based. I think it's 
moving in that direction and it's moving kind of in the direction of the 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 platform that you mentioned William like where you're kind of manipulating the world in a 3D space right I think that ThingLink is getting there um, <clears throat> what I like about ThingLink and there's an example here to the right hand side of the screen is that it's a pretty simple premise I use it a lot for like definitions uh, had my students build these ThingLinks to explain concepts in history. And uh, it, it seemed to me a little bit more exciting than um, you know, just writing a definition down on a piece of paper. So what users do is they upload images, they upload um, any type of media, really. It could be sound, it could be video, uh, it could be text-based. Um, and here we have a, a, a quick thing link on Louis Armstrong that I didn't build, um, but uh, you can build in these little links and that allows students or teachers to kind of click and make the um, make that contact content more interactive by clicking on these links. So what you see here, are the, the couple of little play buttons, those are probably video or, and or audio. Um, the <clears throat> little exclamation point off to the to the left hand side of that example is probably some text based explanation. Um, and what ThingLink is getting into is the, the incorporation of these 3D, uh, 360 degree uh, photos, which allows you to kind of scroll around the environment um, and that eventually you could probably use it with a virtual reality headset. Um, it is free, which is why it's free for educators. Um, which is why I think it's a great tool. Um, these are really easy to embed in most LMS systems. Um, it caters to that multimedia approach. Um, and again, it's not quite AR, VR, um, but it's very versatile, very accessible. And I think they're kind of growing with the times. So um, I've had a lot of success with it and students have tended to like it as a kind of a substitute for, you know, your kind of pen and paper assignments. The next tool is Flipgrid. I know that a lot of my colleagues used Flipgrid um, as a way of capturing student responses. Flipgrid is really fun because it does sort of put the student front and center. Um, Flipgrid AR is kind of a fun tool that um, basically what the students do is they make their Flipgrid videos. So they might explain a, a project in American history, for example. And then what it does is generate a QR code that um, educators, instructors could print the QR code and then post those QR codes throughout the classroom um, so that it's kind of like, like a show and tell. Instead of doing a formal presentation, students might come up with a, a poster board of their project and then what you would do is put that QR code there and then you could walk around the room with your, with your devices and kind of scan the QR code and it pulls up the video of the student explaining what the project is um, you know, in, in, in real space. So uh, it's a really kind of easy to use and fun uh, manipulation of, of reality. So this augmented reality, it's free platform, which is great. Uh, and just like Flipgrid's mission, right? It's a nice way to, highlight student voices in the classroom environment. <clears throat> um, I haven't used this. It may not be, and I'm sure you could do it. I haven't used this as in an asynchronous setting and I haven't embedded this into an LMS, uh, for example. So I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but I'm, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that you could figure it out with a, the right amount of initiative. Uh, and again, the, the, the kind of the benefit of this is that it takes it takes very little time on the part of uh, on the part of the teacher, because, of course, time for a teacher is, is, is um, you know, it's hard to it's hard to find sometimes. Okay. Next is a tool called Augment, um, and we'll we'll try the video. We'll see if it works. Um, Augment was developed initially as an e-commerce tool. So what it does is it allows customers to access these augmented reality images of consumer products. I think a lot of like furniture stores use these now, so that you could buy a couch online, and then you would use your device to kind of see what that couch would look like in your living room, for example. And it's the same idea with Augment. It allows users to upload images, which are then transformed into 3D and or AR formats uh, with accessible smartphones and tablets. Um, it is not free <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it's kind of scaled pricing for educators. Um, what's nice about it is that if you are not feeling particularly um, design savvy, the Augment designers will build your product for you. Um, they have a large library of existing prototypes 
but one thing with augment is that um, educational purposes, education seems to be a kind of an afterthought. afterthought. So I'm going to try to play this. We'll see if it works, um, you know, with the with the Zoom lag time. If not, um, I think we have, I can send copies of this out to you if you wanted to see a little bit more. The age of guesswork is coming to an end. The Augment platform allows businesses to easily deploy mobile augmented reality solutions. Field sales reps simulate products in real size in their customer's environment and close deals more efficiently. Augment for field sales is easy to deploy. Designers and marketing teams simply need to upload and manage their 3D models online. New models automatically appear on the private Augment account of team members. Shoppers can now try products at home before buying or view them in 3D directly from the mobile apps and websites of retailers. Augment provides the largest e-commerce so as you can see, it's a pretty cool tool. Um, it's just not based, I don't think it's quite based towards, um, you know, educational settings. Um, and of course, because it's not free, it might not be the most ideal um, type of platform. I think what most people that I've talked to have used, though, is the next tool that we'll talk about here which, oops, sorry about that. It's Metaverse. I don't know if anybody's had any experience with Metaverse. Metaverse is super, super um, uh, versatile and it can do uh, a lot, a lot of cool things. Um, what's nice about Metaverse is that it is free and it offers scalable price points for educators and or school districts and institutions. Um, it is, um, it's kind of an authoring tool as well. So it allows teachers to build AR scenarios uh, that fits the needs of their classrooms. So that's something that Augment, for example, you kind of have to source that out uh, to a design team. And of course that's more expensive, but Metaverse is, um, you know, it's, it's very accessible. Um, some things that people have done that I've talked to, they've built um, little instructional scenes that kind of pull up characters and they, they work you through a, a little scenario or a, or a problem. Um, some folks have used uh, a, a Metaverse as a, as a way to do a kind of a scavenger hunt um, in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Um, and it also allows you uh, to build in short assessments. Um, so really, really versatile. Um, and uh, I haven't done this, and I don't know of anybody who has, but I know that some educators use Metaverse to allow students to create their own AR scenarios, uh, which could be fun. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you would get some pretty, pretty good results. Um, of course, the issue of time um, for teachers is always uh, is always ever present, um, depending on the scope of a lesson, Metaverse might be kind of a time suck. Um, it could take a long time to develop. But of course, once you do develop that, uh, you can reuse and reuse at will. So I'll pull up a quick clip of this as well, just to give you a sense of what AR looks like. So that just gives you a quick little snippet of what uh, of what metaverse entails. And again, as I said, it's it's very versatile. There's a lot you can do with it. And William, you mentioned Nearpod having a lot of these different like tools as a part and component of it. Um, and really, the same idea with metaverse is that it, it offers anybody uh, just about endless possibilities. Um, and again, one of the benefits of that is that it's it's free to individual educators. Um, and it offers scalable price points for um, institutions, which is nice. So we'll leave, I think we'll leave AR uh, behind us. Hopefully you've gotten a good sense of, of some of the tools that you could kind of uh, 
you know, build into your own teaching uh, and, and kind of, um, you know, hopefully it really engage students that way. Um, we'll move on to VR. VR um, is a bit different than AR. VR is supposed to be that entirely immersive experience. Um, and typically VR is going to require that headset. Um, and of course, headsets are pretty expensive um, and cost prohibitive for a lot of individual teachers for sure, uh, as well as institutions. Um, one uh, advancement in this is that Google and several other companies have introduced these cardboard headsets um, and users slide their own, their smartphones into the headsets, uh, download an app uh, like Google VR to access a library of VR experiences. So I, I think that companies like Google and, and others out there are, are really kind of working on this question of solving for accessibility. Um, and I haven't used, I hadn't used a, a VR headset until about three weeks ago myself, um, but uh, I, I haven't used one of these cardboard devices so I'm, I'm pretty excited to actually check that out and see what kind of <clears throat> experience that entails. Now, uh, William, you mentioned Nearpod. Um, maybe you were thinking about 360 Cities or Nearpod VR. Um, and Nearpod, I, I like Nearpod as a whole because I think it's really versatile, um, just like Metaverse. And it offers um, educators a lot of different tools to kind of build into even one lesson. Uh, so this VR for field trip might be just one part and component of, of a bigger lesson that, um, that someone is building. <clears throat> the VR field trip um, offers users the chance to explore a, a library of different destinations. Um, you can use a cardboard VR set, a uh, headset, or you can just use a regular device like a computer or a tablet or a smartphone even. Um, and what you do then is just kind of drag yourself around that virtual world uh, and explore that 360 environment. Um, Nearpod, as William mentioned, offers free and scalable pricing for individuals and institutions. The free version is not that bad. Um, I've used that myself. Um, and what's nice about this, as well as any of the other VR tools that I'll be talking about, is that no outside equipment is needed right now, right? So you can have those headsets. You don't need them. Um, Nearpod, the 360 cities, it offers, um, it offers you kind of a, a selection, and that's the selection that you get. There's a stock library of destinations that you can play around with, um, and it doesn't allow users to build scenarios. So it's not like ThingLink and it's not like some of the other tools that I'll talk about here in just a moment, but it is a pretty cool introductory step to, um, you know, that 360, that 360 world uh, and that sort of the, the virtual environment. And it seems as though students are kind of into that, you know, into the kind of exploring these spaces um, on their own as well. Um, what I've used is Scenario VR. Um, Scenario VR is a component of the eLearning Brothers um, authoring suite, and it allows users the chance to build their own VR learning environments. So what it needs is access to uh, 360 degree photographs. So if you have a 360 degree capable camera, then you can build your own scenarios truly. Otherwise, you have to work with kind of stock photos and stock library uh, images that allow you to build these different scenarios. Um, what you do is that once you have those photographs, you can build in little infographic cards. You can build in assessments. You can add dialogue and sounds to each different scenario that you build. And just like the, the 360, the virtual reality tour um, that Nearpod offers, it allows um, you to kind of move around in that 360 degree world. Um, and again, headsets are not required. You can use a computer, you can use a smartphone, you can use a, a tablet to kind of navigate yourself around. Um, as a kind of a quick um, experiment with this program, I guess, I built a quick tour of the city of Paris. So I started the user uh, right in front of Notre Dame, which is right in the middle of Paris. They could either then choose to go into the cathedral and then answer questions and learn more about the building of the cathedral. Then they could leave the cathedral and then head up the Seine and go to the Louvre uh, and kind of navigate the way through the city of Paris, um, which uh, I, I thought was really fun to build. And it really only took me about 15 minutes. So not difficult at all. Um, 
so you can customize that VR environment for just about any lesson imaginable. Um, it offers uh, sort of a, an instructor dashboard that allows the instructor to track performance on assessments that are built right into that um, into that uh, uh, scenario that you build. And this is not free, unfortunately. Um, they, they offer quote unquote affordably priced packages that start at $89 per month, which for an individual teacher or educator may not be that, uh, that affordable. But if institutions were looking at, um, uh, you know, adopting this type of technology, maybe even through an instructional, an instructional designer who then sort of builds out these scenarios for different educators, um, then I think that that cost is probably uh, a little bit more manageable. So I'll give you a taste of the authoring suite here. And we'll play this video, a little snippet. It's kind of a long lead in. So as you can see, it this is a, a demo that I played around with quite a bit on on uh, the scenario VR. Is it what right now? As we left it, um, they're building in some assessment questions, uh, which again are tracked on a an instructor dashboard, so you can see how your students are performing, and then kind of track those milestones uh, and and you know uh, you know performance metrics. And then um, similar, I've not used this one. This is very similar to Scenario VR as far as I can tell. Uh, same concept is that it's a kind of a priced out VR authoring tool that uh, works very, even the, the dashboard template, the building template here is, is pretty similar to what um, we just talked about with Scenario VR. Um, just like that, you can build in interactive hotspots. Um, this looks like a lab. So, you know, you could go from, from doing an ecological study of, uh, you know, coral reefs to a, a science lab. Um, the possibilities are endless. Um, and again, what you would do is upload a, a 360 degree image uh, photograph of a lab and then you can build in your assessments you can build in little hot spots so if students navigate around the lab they might click on something it might pull up a video um, and they would watch the video and it's totally instructional and uh, there might be little hot spots where they're asked questions so they might follow up with with some questions to ensure that they're understanding and that they're you know uh, learning what they need to learn and the same thing here is that right now students do not need virtual reality headsets um, it offers instructors the chance to develop their own VR environments, which is really cool. Um, that instructor dashboard um, produces data and analytics that you can track and follow to make sure that students are, you know, learning what they need to learn. And again, the same thing here, it's a quote unquote affordably priced at $99 a month, um, which again, for the individual teacher may not be all that affordable, um, but uh, at the institutional level, um, probably more likely. Um, and I would say that given the shortage of time that teachers have, and, and given the way that these, these packages are built, it might be kind of good to have, uh, you know, a, a centralized hub of an instructional designer who would then be responsible for building out this type of material for uh, individual teachers and instructors. Um, but it is super fun to play around with. Um, and it's really, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, building these things and building them creatively, um, that's exactly why I got into instructional design in the first place, because as a teacher, I never had enough time, uh, you know, to, to be that creative. 
Um, so that's it for these tools um, at this point. I'm, I'm sure if we check back in in about six months, there would be an entire new <laughs> list of new tools, of new cutting te edge technology. Um, and that's the name of the game these days, is that these companies kind of witnessed and watched what happened in the pandemic, and it's off to the races. Uh, and they're really kind of trying to get a leg up on one another. And of course, the upside of that is that as educators, we have new uh, products to play around with. Um, these products might offer increased specialization for one discipline or one field or for one age group. Um, and they can appeal to learners of all different types, depending on the program. Uh, but the downside, of course, is keeping up with this new technology and, and also investing money in the right, in the right products and the right tools. Um, so as I kind of wind up here, as I conclude, I think that if, if we're thinking about these early AR and VR environments, I think they're really important to kind of get a hold on and get a handle of uh, for a number of reasons. First is that they help to diversify learning. So uh, for example, I wouldn't recommend necessarily having students sit for eight hours a day in a VR headset because you know, it's it, after a while, it becomes no different than sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day. But um, if you break this up and chunk this up into smaller segments, I think it's a really fun way to increase um, to increase student engagement. Um, and then secondly, if we're incorporating small chunks of these AR and VR uh, technologies into the classroom in that way, it's really going to help familiarize students who are uncomfortable with technology maybe who don't have access to technology regularly, or maybe those students who just aren't motivated, uh, you know, to do well in school. But I think that as we give those students, uh, you know, access to different bits and pieces uh, of these new technologies, I think that they'll become more comfortable as the digital landscape continues to change. Um, so I will leave it there. Um, as I mentioned here at the end, really, um, when we're talking about this technology, for the most part, other than some of those tiered price, pan, price plans, um, what we're talking about as a basic startup is access to a smartphone or a tablet, uh, which uh, I think a lot of schools um, are, are hard at work trying to provide. So I'll leave it there. Um, if you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to uh, chime in. Wow. <laughs> Jamie, thank you. Um, this was an incredibly amazing presentation. This third part, the tools have really uh, blown me away. So I can't wait to start tinkering with some of them. We do have about two minutes. So before our 10 o'clock presentation kicks off. So anyone in the audience want to share a comment or raise a question? I'll go. <laughs> I'm so glad to have caught most of your presentation, Jamie. Hi. Hi, Shelly. Um, <laughs> um, but I was wondering, I've been so curious about metaverse. And yesterday we were talking about escape rooms in Google oh. Classroom and Google Tools and how, you know, it's good, you know, Aaron was telling us how to have a template, right? That once you set it up, you can kind of plunk it in different content and it works. Um, and I wondered if that was possible in some of these tools. Metaverse is my main question, but I don't know when it comes to AR and VR, do you find that there's that versatility or is it like really unique to the lesson? Well, I, I think Metaverse offers that. Uh, maybe a little bit more so than like ThingLink. I think you have to kind of build these things out for each lesson that you're doing. Um, but Metaverse offers, I, I, I think that you could kind of plug and play a little bit. Um, and the same thing with that scenario VR is that you, as long as you have that stock image of, or those, those images that you can kind of build scenarios out of, um, then you could take questions or question templates and kind of incorporate them uh, into each unique lesson. So thank you, that was a good question. Oh, thanks. I'm so excited to try all these. <laughs> Well, thank you. I know our team is <laughs> probably are familiar with the resource referatory, but your session was full of resources that hopefully we can add if they are not already in our resource referatory. And your presentation now will also be part of it. So there offers a human description of how yeah. to use some of them. So um, I also really appreciate that your 
session was framed around really important questions, Jamie, that these tools aren't just tools. It's always about the interaction with the humans that are using them, the context, the communities, um, where they're located, what resources are available. So I appreciate you for not losing sight of that in the beginning or here on your concluding slide. So thank you for humanizing. The <laughs> of course. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Awesome. Well, I think we could uh, all unmute and <laughs> thank you. For Yay. Yay. No, this was perfect, Jamie. Thank you so much for, for coming and sharing with us. Yeah, of course. Anytime. <laughs>